And once again, I'm very grateful for all of you tonight that are with us. Those who have joined us in live stream, we're going to be in Amos tonight. This will be our 54th exposition, and we'll, we'll have one more after this, and we'll be finished with Amos. <clears throat> we're going to be in Amos 9, verses 10 through 12 tonight. I wanted, by way of introduction, to make a few comments about the superiority and uniqueness of God as seen in His Word. He's not a man. He's not like a man. And He doesn't speak like a man. Now, this has particular reference to the reasoning that's found in Scripture. Of course, we're going to have some of this uh, tonight. He, he reasons. God reasons in Scripture with us. But he doesn't reason like a man. Whenever God reasons or declares mm -hmm. or questions or comments, it's always with his purpose in mind. That's the undergirding factor. He never spends time on things unrelated to himself or his purpose. And there are some things related to his purpose that are like their, their negative influences. But he deals with them from his perspective, not from our perspective. When we fail to see this, we get confused. And uh, I don't think we could promise you that you would never be confused. <laughs> or that you would not be confounded, you know to its extent, but it shouldn't last long. Amen. There should be a, a sort of a rapid recovery from this so that you're able to adapt to God's manner, mm -hmm. how, he, how he reasons. Amen. Now, the more a person thinks like man, the harder it is to understand yeah. Scripture. Amen. And you really you can't avoid this. There are people, maybe maybe some of you have had difficulty with some text or some strain of Scripture. It's because you're thinking like a man. Yeah. That's just why that is. I say Scripture because that's a revelation. We shouldn't have, any, we shouldn't have a lot of trouble with Scripture because it's a revelation. Yeah. So uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You, could, you wouldn't say that you didn't understand a revelation. That's not a contradiction of contradiction of terms, but if a person said he didn't understand the Bible, that's like a, that's a contradicting idea. How can it be a revelation and yet not be able to be understood? The purpose of a revelation is to, to be understood. <laughs> and I know that sounds simple, but it just that kind of has to be said because it can get tripped up once in a while as though, as though that wasn't the case. Yes, Brother Jason? I was having a, a similar thought today. I was... Um doing some study, and uh, you know how the disciples, for some reason, when Jesus told, he told them plainly, the yeah. Son of Man, we're going to go to Jerusalem, the yeah. Son of Man is going to be handed over, yeah. he's going to be crucified, yeah. and it says, and they they, they didn't understand yeah. the meaning of this thing. Yeah. And I was mulling that over, and it, it occurred to me that one of the reasons that we don't understand things is because so it's not because the thing itself isn't clear. Mm -hmm. It's because there's something in our minds that we're hanging on to. That's or, right. or, or, or it contradicts something that we hold dear. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. In, the, in my example that I gave you, the disciples, they, their idea of the Christ was contradicted That's by, right. by mm -hmm. Jesus That's saying, right. I'm going to die. So yeah. that, uh -huh. that was so foreign to their understanding of the Christ and the kingdom of God. He's not going to die. He's going to remain forever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so it contradicted their, their presupposition. So therefore, it says they didn't understand they didn't the meaning. Understand. That's, right. That's what happens. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. It's a great insight, yeah. isn't it? It... it uh, once you see that, it helps to keep, to promote alertness. Yeah. And alertness has to do with spotting a, a contrary way of thinking. Mm -hmm. Now, believe me when I tell you that some people 
they're thinking like a man, but they don't think they're thinking like a man. (laughs) They think they're thinking like a church man, but a a church man is still a man. (laughs) Or a a sectarian man, or they're thinking thinking like a, you fit in the denominational name, they're thinking like that kind of person, but that's all flesh, that's all man. You've got to be thinking like God. And it's only you can only think like God to the degree you have a working knowledge of Scripture. Yes, yeah. It's to sure. that degree. Yes. Yeah, like, right. We understand that you, you, there's a beginning and there's growth and so forth, but it's to, to the precise degree yeah. that you have a working knowledge of Scripture that you're able to kind of track mm-hmm. and don't have to say like like that incident incident that. Jason mentioned they didn't talk like that after Pentecost. Didn't right. Their knowledge kind of caught, right. kind of caught up, and they didn't. Then at Pentecost, he got Peter expounded the thing that he was confounded by before. Right. Yes, but I, and, uh, you were talking about um, sharpening up our sharpening up our minds, and the hmm. Lord has given us His mind, and so, that's why in Ephesians it talks about <laughs> renewing that mind. Yeah, that's right. And so. The carnal mind can't understand the things of God. It just can't. But the new mind that we've been given in Christ yeah. Jesus can. That's why there's, we have to constantly renew it because, you've said before, this earth has a dulling effect mm-hmm. on our mind yeah, and our faculties. Right. Mm-hmm. And um, by sharpening the mind, sharpening um, the new man, sharpening the new nature, uh, we have the mind of Christ to understand right. his, mm-hmm. his thoughts. Amen. 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 Yeah, that isn't something you, you get it today, and then it kind of stays with you. Uh, yeah. And as you say, it has to be renewed because you're you're not living in a vacuum. So you're not in a moral and spiritual vacuum. There's conflicting forces and personalities where you are. That's why this has to be maintained. It's what Isaac has said. Now the reason for the vast difference between the Divine mind and human reasoning and expression is isn't easily defined. Like you can't, it's hard to academically mm-hmm. say it. You notice that when what Isaac just finished saying would sound like gobbledygook to a carnal man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he wouldn't pick up on that mm-hmm. at all. So it's it this it, it cannot be defined that academically or like a dictionary or like it can't be defined that way. It's defined by perception. Being able to discern good and evil, see? Uh-huh. Have your senses exercised to discern yeah. good and evil. You know, a child might not, might not know much about a leopard, but once they see one, uh, yeah. <laughs> they kind of pick up on what a leopard is. Yeah. Everything God say, says is in some way related to what he's doing. That's that's really got to be seen. Everything God says is related in some way to what He's doing. And it's only to the extent that you are involved by faith in what He's doing that you can decipher what He said. Now, that being said, we'll proceed with this text. This is quite a wonderful text we have here tonight. Amos 9, 10 through 12. All the sinners of my people shall die by the sword, which say, The evil shall not overtake nor prevent us. In that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David that's fallen and close up the breaches thereof, and I will raise up his ruins, and I will build it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom, And of all the heathen which are called by my name, saith the Lord, that doeth this. Now, they didn't understand that for hundreds of years. But we'll have some help on it tonight. Now, notice the certainty and finality with which God speaks. He doesn't say things like, this can happen, this, this may happen, this should happen. This is possibly to happen. 
You notice how God doesn't talk that way. Men talk that way because we know we don't know what a day may bring forth. We we've got to speak that way because we don't know what a day is going to bring forth. Yeah. To say nothing of a week or a month or a year, <laughs> we don't know. But God, he, it's not He's not handicapped that way at all. Every word of God is sure uh -huh. and pure. Uh, speaking of the law, the scriptures say in Hebrews 2.2 2, that every word that was spoken was steadfast. Uh -huh. it, it held up under wind, fire, water, mm -hmm. trial, contradiction, enemies. It still st stood steadfast. Um, you can hold on to the word of God and it'll never, mm -hmm. it'll never move. Yeah, that's right. Won't do it. You live by every word of God. See, that makes for stability because it's an unchangeable word. The word of God is attempt, uh, intended to accomplish something. God's word just like aren't, isn't like philosophical words tossed out into the air and then do whatever you want with them. It's not that. God's word is always does something. It accomplishes something, and it never comes back without doing what God sent it to do. It accomplishes that word until it was sent. Mm -hmm. So if he said uh, to the waters, fish, multiply in there, that, and the word comes back, that's, that's what's going on. That's right. yeah. Let there be light, the word comes back, and light's there. Yeah. Amen. Uh, you got a master of that when he says, be holy when it comes yeah. back. <laughs> when it comes back, that's right. it's going to accomplish. If, if, you, if you will keep that word, and hide it in your heart, yeah. it'll accomplish yes. Amen. what God sent it out to do. Now you know the danger, see, of, the, of distraction. Now, it's, a, it's necessary that God's people reject what the critics, what mm -hmm. God's critics say about his word. You don't have to test it to see is it true or not. That's right. If it contradicts the word, it's, you don't test it. It's just, why do you do that? Because if you don't, that thought, <laughs> it'll crop up at the most unexpected yeah. time when you would to God that didn't wasn't there. Mm -hmm. That's what will happen. If, for instance, you read after men that don't understand Scripture or you make a practice of listening to them, Pretty soon their words, they penetrate your thinking, and then and then you got to wrestle with them. Amen. So I understand that you have to recognize that this is the case, but when you recognize something that's contradictory, just turn it off uh -huh. right away. Amen. Now he starts out by saying, all. Yeah. yeah. Just what you were saying there. Uh, we live in a time where, where people, and this is where the thinking of man is, when people would object to what you said, oh, I know. Mm -hmm. because they're saying, no, no, you're, you're saying that we should be closed-minded. Right. But the fact that you're giving an entrance to that kind of talk is a form of unbelief. Mm -hmm. Good. Amen. You, if you know that God is, and that his word is true mm -hmm. for you not to, as soon as you recognize something is contradicting or opposing the truth of God, it's wrong. Mm -hmm. It's like it's an offense to God because you're saying, well, maybe God wasn't right about that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe he didn't say it like he meant it. Uh -huh. Maybe there's more to this yeah. than what... Oh, I hear the hiss of a snake. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You remember they said that by and Philetus that they taught that the script that the resurrection is past mm -hmm. and overthrow the faith That's right. of some. Uh -huh. Now the some were people that listened to it and said, "Well, I never thought about it just exactly that way, but maybe I viewed this wrong." See that he says their word eats like a canker That's right. Amen. or yeah, cancer. God said, you go to the rest of what he said. That's right. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. 
He said, the prophet said, if they speak not according to this word, to the word and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it's because no light is in them. See, it's straightforward. Now, as I say, our text says all, all the sinners. Now, some texts say, they don't say it this way. The contemporaneous version says, some of you. <coughs> English Revised Version says, sinners among my people. And the Good News Bible says, and the sinners among my people. Now, technically, oh, you could make a case for this, but you got to take this way it says. He's addressing all the sinners. Amen. He's not addressing an assembly saying, the sinners among you. You see, all the sinners. They're a group that they're, they're, they're together. They're a composite of human personalities. All the sinners. Now, we wish it could be said that there was never any sinners among any of God's people. We, that's, we, we desire that be the case, but even the early church, there were Ananias and Sapphira, but what the words addressed to Ananias and Sapphira were addressed to them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the church at Sardis, now most of them were mm -hmm. dead. I have some, yeah. mm -hmm. in, even in Sardis, which means this was a really, mm -hmm. probably a mega church that had something for everybody. They had a name, they were alive. But they were dead. They had, uh, they had a few there, though, that, see, there was a few. Not, I'm showing you that there are t times when God does speak of a group within a group, but here he just speak, He just addresses this one single body of body of people. So sinners, that, that's not meant to be a generic word either. Sinners. At the predominant trait of this body of people he's addressing, the predominant trait is they're, they're sinful. They sin. They sin. They live in transgression. They live in opposition to God. They're always out of the way, missing the mark. That's, that's what they're known for. That's their trait. All sinners, whole body of people, now, bringing this concept into the future, into the present, there were some in Israel that were not of Israel. Mm -hmm. See, as Romans nine six says, some some in Israel that weren't of Israel as God defines Israel. Yeah, Even so, there are some in the church that are not of the church. Yeah, crept in unawares. Jude said they crept in unawares. So they looked like they were part, but they weren't. Mm -hmm. Now the Lord knows, of course, them that are His. He has no difficulty yeah. with this at all. That's why He can speak like this text does. Mm -hmm. He knew who this was. All uh, the sinners. Those who are, God knows who's in the book of life. Yeah. Everyone who's not in the book of life are in the category of sinners. Yeah. So he, he, he's addressing, he's addressing these kind of people here, all the sinners, all of them. Now our, our aim is not to be in that number. We, mm -hmm. I know people say, we're all sinners. Well, no, I just, that's not the way God talks. Amen. When he Amen. says all the sinners, he's not, he doesn't mean all the people. Mm -hmm. yeah. Isn't what he means. And uh, there were people that were groups of professing Christians that were identified as sinners. James identified them as they were adulterers and adulteresses. They should have taken the name. If they had a name, they should have. See, some churches should have, we are sinners. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Don't come here. If you're seeking God, don't. Mm -hmm. There should be a warning label. See, yeah. e even in the world, they have warning labels. Something, something's not, 
they would set up a warning label on it. And back in the old west, you know, when they go out, they'd find these poison water or waters. They'd put a post up there. It's, don't drink this. Yeah. Yeah, it needs to be that, you know, in the religion. Yeah. Don't drink yeah. this. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. All have sinned, but all not all sinned. are sinners. That's mm -hmm. right. Yes. That's right. There seems to be a confusion about this today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, there is a great deal of confusion. So yeah. people, people say, well, we're all sinners. Well, what they mean to say is, well, all have sinned. All mm -hmm. have sinned. But to say, that, to say that all of God's people are habitually living in sin, that this can't be. Yeah, that's, that's right. right. Well, you hope that they mean to say that. Yeah. yeah. yeah that's you right. hope that they're not yeah. telling the truth, but mm. they may be telling the truth. They may be telling oh, yeah. the truth. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I just heard a song today. Famous, <laughs> famous songwriter singing Christian songs, talking about how much he was out at the bar last night getting drunk and sinning all kinds of. He said, Right at that time, God gave me this song. That's what he said. <laughs> yes, well, I don't doubt it. Yes, I don't doubt it. So well, just a moment, we want to strike that one from the book. So our objective is not to be in that uh, number. That would remove what those who are not in that number are excluded from what the scripture calls false brethren. That's, uh, how's that for some phrase? Huh? False brethren. It's mentioned a couple of places. False brethren. Paul, well, that was some of the people that tried him. Some of his trials, he listened to 2 Corinthians 11, always beaten and all this. And one of the trials was that he had perils, perils among false brethren. Hmm. I, think, I think a lot of us could say we've experienced that. Perils. Among false brethren, none of us are strong enough to habitually be around false yeah. brethren. Amen. Amen. And Paul wasn't habitually around them. Just the fact that he encountered him, it was perilous. Yes, that's right. Oh, I'm going to visit such my mother's church. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I like to go to church with mom. Mm -hmm. I'm just kind of making a... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it could be perilous. Yes. Could be perilous to do that. You better ask mom to come to church with you. And what about all these sinners? All the sinners of my people. What are you going to say to them, Lord? Oh, they're going to die by the sword. This is God now. This is God talking. All the sinners of my people. Now, this is said after he's warned them. He's been long-suffering with them. He sent prophets to them, rising up early giving them time to repent. He says, all the sinners of my people are going to die by the sword. That phrase, by the sword, that's mentioned 69 times in Scripture. By the sword. Military sword he's talking about. Jesus has a sword too, a sword off, out of his mouth, which he slays people. One time, uh, you see, that's a sword that's by human instrumentality as compared to, say, a plague. Mm -hmm. but that, that's not like a sword. Mm -hmm. And we have in Scripture that where 24,000 people died of a plague at one time. At one time. At one time. 24,000 people died of a plague. And another time, in, in, a, in a single day, 70,000 men died of a pestilence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, the day after the core of David and Abiram, 14,000. 14, mm -hmm. See, so that's as compared to the sword. See, so there's the flood. That they don't, that wasn't by the sword. Mm -hmm. See, but he said these are going to die by the sword. Right? By enemies, fellow men are going to come in and kill them. God once said to Israel, Jeremiah fifty-one twenty, that they would be his battle axe and weapons. How was that? <laughs> Be God's battle axe and weapons. That's what it says. He used men to punish men. Yeah, amen. It was God that did it. He used Nebuchadnezzar as a weapon against impenitent Israel and other nations as well. So they'll die by the sword 
Well, which ones are you talking about specifically, Lord? I'm talking about the ones he said which say the evil will not overtake us. No way. This isn't going to happen to us. We are the strongest military nation. We have uh, surveillance equipment and drones. God says, I'm talking to those people think they're safe. This will never come near us. It will not overtake us. Even when the prophets warned the people, they said, this isn't going to happen to us. For instance, Isaiah said that these people said, it shall not come unto us, for we've made lies our refuge and under falsehood have we hid ourselves. That's God interpreting what they said. But is it just this trouble you're talking about, Isaiah, this isn't going to come to us. This is going to come to us. We're safe. Jeremiah affirmed that they said this. The law shall not perish from the priest. This isn't going to happen. Nor counsel from the wise. Nor the word from the prophet. Things are going to keep going. we got everything in place. We've got things monitoring the program. This is going to come near us. So they said, let's smite him with the tongue and let's not give heed to any of his words. Jeremiah is telling us all this stuff is going to happen. This isn't going to happen. Yeah. Haven't you read the attendance board in the bulletin? Yeah. We're doing really well. So far as Israel was concerned, things were going to continue as they had been, quite frankly, for centuries. They've been continuing. Therefore, they aligned themselves against the warning prophets. Now God speaks to them. I'm not going to send prophets now. I'm going to send enemies with a sword. Yeah. These are the people that say evil shall not come and, and it will not prevent us. Prevent here means to meet or confront or stand before your face, before you. As a prevent means before. When it says that we that are living shall in no wise prevent the dead. It means we're not going to raise up in the air before them. So here, it will not prevent us means that these circumstances you're talking about, all right, we're not going to have to face these. We're not going to have to confront these. They're not going to catch us unawares. God says, to those that say that, I'm going to kill them with a sword what I'm going to do. Enemies, and the enemies, of course, did come in and do this. Verse 11, he says, In that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David that's fallen and close up the breaches thereof, and I'll raise up his ruins and will build it as of the days of old. And we'll find ordinarily that God does speak within the greater context of what he has or will do. So he told you what they were doing, but he didn't. He doesn't, he doesn't stop. Now he's going to tell you what he's going to do. Or he told him what he was going to do because of what they were doing. Now he's going to tell him what he's going to do that had, wasn't dependent at all on what they were doing. See, there's some things God does as a response. There's other things he does just because he purposed to do it that doesn't make any difference how men respond to it. He's going to do this. If we had no later exposition of this text, it, it would be difficult to understand, raising up the tabernacle day. But the, we do have a, a later exposition of this text, which we'll deal with. I will raise up the tabernacle of David. Now, other versions, I don't like the way they translate it because it, it's too etymological, but here's, here's what they say. I will raise up the fallen booth of David. That's the New American Standard. I will restore David's fallen tent. That's the New International Version. The tent of David will come down, basic Bible English. Contemporary English Bible, the meeting tent of David that has fallen. New American Bible, the fallen hut of David. The Net Bible, I will rebuild the collapsing hut. New Jerusalem Bible, I'll rebuild the tottering hut of David. And the New Living Translation, the fallen house of David. Now see, when we know what the text means, this is 
these translators should have been familiar with scripture. I have more and more have seen that a lot of the translators weren't scripturally literate. They just went word by word and checked the lexicon and picked the word, the alternative word they'd like. Now what this word is talking about is the house that God said he was going to build David. That's what, that's what he's talking about here. And the promise is made in 2 Samuel 7, 11. The prophet told David, also the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee an house. Or that's, that's the house. The word translated tabernacle also means pavilion. Is also a, it doesn't always mean tent, depending on the context that it's used in. This is the tabernacle to which the text refers, the house that God is going to build for David. And as I mentioned, while well, the, the word tabernacle is used, Hebrew word translated tabernacle is used to, to express uh, tabernacle and booth and tent, it is also used to express pavilion or a sturdy, uh -huh. and that's how it's used here. Here amidst the word of rebuke and judgment, God brings up the salvation that would be affected by the Lord Jesus. Now this is what, he, he's, what he's talking about. The day of salvation what he's talking about. But he's going to raise up the house. I'll make you a house. Jesus was going to be the head of that house. And this is what he's talking about. After I've knocked this thing down that you're building... And after it looks like David's house has fallen down and has become defunct, I'm going to build it. I'm going to close up the breaches and raise up its ruins. It's been lying idle for a number of centuries now. In David's day, his house was his kingdom. And it was impressive and glorious. It is written of David during his life, David went on and grew great. And the Lord God of hosts was with him at the house. He was a builder in the house back yeah. then. Again, and David waxed stronger and stronger, and the house of Saul waxed weaker and weaker. God is building that house. And the fame of David went out into all lands, and the Lord brought the fear of him upon all nations. He is building. Yeah. Amen. Actually, he's building this framework of the house. Yeah. If you really want to get technical about it, he's building the framework of the house. Eventually, however, it is written, Israel rebelled against the house of David. That starts to fall. The house that fell, when we rebuild the house that fell, it begins to fall. And it lost its prominence. The house was God promised David. The Lord would not, but it is also written in Second Chronicles 21.7, The Lord would not destroy the house of David. Because of the covenant that he had made with David, mm -hmm. and as he promised to give a light to him and to his sons forever. So he, the house fell down, but he, it wasn't destroyed. Amen. But by I, all the people thought the kingdom of David was gone, so the how this house didn't come to pass. But God pledged to build a house for David. We're going to find that he, after... They despised the house of David, and the house of David went into ruins. Mm -hmm. God's going to build it up, refurbish it Amen. again. Now, does this also accent to everyone looking on that only God could do this? That's right. <laughs> Amen. Now, the building of the tabernacle, or I would call it pavilion, was going to be accomplished by the Messiah. He's mm -hmm. the one that's going to mm -hmm. build it. As a matter of fact, as Isaiah said, the key of the house of David, mm -hmm. the key of the house of David, mm -hmm. will I lay upon his shoulder. Yeah, amen. And he shall open, amen. and none shall shut, and he amen. shall shut, and none shall open. That's, mm -hmm. the, that's the building of the house, mm -hmm. see. After these days, I'm going to build a house. And I promise I'm going to build a house, but I'm going to do it through, mm -hmm. through my yeah. son, mm -hmm. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Amen. Zechariah said, In that day there shall be a fountain opened to the house of David. Mm -hmm. 
and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and uncleanness. See? <laughs> you see where this is going? Yeah, this, is going. Yeah. this is wonderful. I'll tell Amen. You. Now, centuries pass. Jesus has died. He went back mm -hmm. to heaven. Mm -hmm. The church arrests them with a problem of circumcision. Mm -hmm. They reason out about it. And during this conference mm -hmm. on circumcision, mm -hmm. James unearths this prophecy uh -huh. we just read. Yeah. <laughs> he hears about the acceptance of the Gentiles. Peter says that he was, says, I was the first one. Mm. And these people received the like gift as we did. Mm. He said they're going to be saved by the grace of God just like we are. Mm. Paul and Barnabas, they got up and gave their testimony, no question about it. The Gentiles are being converted and the number of them was growing. Mm. James will listen to all of this. Mm -hmm. And he interrupts. Mm -hmm. He says, this fulfills the word. Mm -hmm. And it was Amos's word. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Here's what he said after this Acts 15, 15 through 17. Mm -hmm. After this I will return. I will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will build again the ruins thereof. I will set it up. Mm -hmm. That the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. Amen. That's a hint of the, He wasn't an apostle, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm sure you know this wasn't James, the brother of John, because that James was, mm -hmm. was martyred by Herod yeah. in Acts yeah. 12. Mm -hmm. And this is after Acts 12. Mm-hmm. This is James, the Lord's brother, and he was a key person in the church of Amen. Jerusalem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, he saw this. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know that Jesus is called in Scripture the root of David. That's right. Mm -hmm. Root yeah. and offspring of David. And it said, uh, Isaiah said it's like a root out of dry, dry ground. ground. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So it's, there's an interesting image here. It's like God can revive his work mm -hmm. that yes. seems to lie dormant. It's yeah. like a root. Yeah. Lying in dry ground, he said that nothing will ever come of that root. Then all at once it springs. Mm -hmm. There it is. I think, up I, the earth. Go ahead. I think yes. it was Habakkuk that said, Revive thy work, O God. Yeah. Yeah. yeah he could revive the work. Amen. With, the, Jews had, the Jews had kind of forgotten that God was going to include the Gentiles. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. These are Christian people. They're having this council because these are Christian right. people mm -hmm. who were offended that Gentiles That's were right. coming in. They had mm -hmm. forgotten that God was going to do this. Mm. And there he was doing it right under their nose. That's right. The, mm. the way that council ended up is they said, they basically said, we better not get in God's way. That's you right. Know? Amen. Well, that God has given, has given repentance to yeah, him. Amen. Yeah. Paul later said this was the mystery. That's right. Uh -huh. yeah, we're going to touch on that. That's yeah. right. Also, <laughs> it says salvation is of the Jews. What they also neglected was that the Gentiles were believing the message that they had been given. That's right. Mm -hmm. Where'd they hear it from? Amen. amen. But isn't that, isn't that wonderful how yeah. James saw that? Would you have seen it if James hadn't said it? Well, you, maybe you would have. I don't know, but I'm glad he saw it. <laughs> and he said it, but it's remarkable. And this wasn't an apostle. This, this wasn't an apostle. But he's, he put it all together right there while the meeting was going on. He put it all together, and his word was the end of all. At the end of any kind of controversy, that was it. They all held their peace. See, it appears as though the house of David had fallen down. And couldn't be raised up again. It, it looked like it had disappeared and was beyond hope. And if we were speaking of his political kingdom, this was true. That's right. But we're not speaking of his political kingdom. We're speaking of the house God said he was going to build in. And hundreds of years later, that house would be built. The government of it would be put on Christ's shoulder. And he'd administer the house. It was his house. Whose house are we? Amen. Being built up. The house of David, when it was built, well, it had to be expanded for the Gentiles. Isaiah 54 tells you about that. After Isaiah 53 comes Isaiah 54, and it tells us to expand the tent, enlarge the border. Remove the pegs out. Yeah. Why? The Gentiles are coming in. Amen. 
<laughs> and of course, Peter preached this on the day of Pentecost. He said that God raised up Jesus to sit on David's throne. Now that was the same promise, except it's from the standpoint of administration rather than building. When Jesus said, I will build my church, that church was David's house that God is building for him. It was a tabernacle of David. This time, as I said, it was the house of David was going to be bigger than it was yeah. in the idea in the minds of men when it was first told. Now the twelfth verse says that they may possess the remnant of Edom, that's Israel, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and of all the heathen which are called by my name. Saith the Lord that doeth this, possess the remnant of Edom. Some versions say what is left of Edom, or the few survivors of Edom. See, Amos had already himself pronounced a judgment against Edom. In the first chapter, verses 6 to 11, he pronounced a judgment against Edom. Some of the prophets did too. Now, Edom was unique. They were near kinfolk <laughs> to Israel. In fact, God protected, he protected Edom. He wouldn't let Israel take their land because yeah. uh -huh. they were near, close of kin. Esau, was his name was Edom, and he was the father of the Edomites, the Scripture says. Jeremiah said Edom would become a desolation. Jer Jeremiah, or Ezekiel said God was going to make Edom desolate and lay his vengeance on them. Joel said Edom would be a desolate wilderness. Obadiah said God would destroy the wise men out of Edom. Malachi prophesied that whatever Edom built up, God would take down. Yet the Edomites would not utterly be removed. It'd be a remnant of Edom. Amen. Gentiles. And they'd be included in the house. Mm -hmm. you know, this is God. I'll tell you, this is remarkable. This is God. Yeah. I'm even going to take the Edomites, yeah. the offspring of Esau, and I'm going to take the remnant of them, and I'm going to bring them in the house. And all the heathen. I'm going to bring them in too, the nations or the people. These are all the other people as distinguished from the Edomites who were the offspring of Esau and the Israelites who were the offspring of Jacob. Yeah. See? Uh -huh. Which are called by my name. <laughs> Some of our other versions say that bear my name or have been named by my name or bearing my name. Now, this is a language of foreknowledge and election. Amen. Amen. He knew these ahead of time. He knew these mm -hmm. from Edom and all the other heathen. They were going to be brought into the house. Mm -hmm. Going to build a house for David. They, they'd be part of, the, part of the house. He refers to people chosen by God unto whom the door of salvation could not be opened mm -hmm. until Jesus took away sin rose from the dead, ascended back to heaven, yeah. and seated at the right hand of God with all power in heaven and earth. Amen. The door couldn't be opened to these people until then. Amen. You can see that, I'm sure. Amen. God promised David he'd commence, his house had commenced to be built under the administration of Jesus. I, the Lord, will do it. And, of course, the fact that Jesus is the head of the house, this house, is mentioned in Hebrews 3, 2 through 6. He is in charge of the house that God is building for David, mm -hmm. which includes the remnant of Edom mm -hmm. and all the heathen. Now, this verse that we just read, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the heathen, which are called by my name, saith the Lord, to do with this. Here's how James refers to that text. 
that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord who doeth all these things. The uh, New King James Version says, so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. Huh? Even all Gentiles are called by my name, saith the Lord, who does all these things. New Revised End Version says, In order that the rest of mankind, see, I'm building the house, yeah. in order that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. Mm -hmm. Is this? Yeah. <laughs> if men were left to build this house, this never would have happened. Amen. That's it, Brother Jason. Mm -hmm. I think this principle. Uh, that we're talking about here with this fulfillment in the Gentiles, the same principle applies now to the Jews. Okay? That's right. Because he's, what he's saying is David's house looked like it had fallen down. Mm -hmm. There was a root in dry ground. That's right. That's right. Can this thing ever blossom again? Will this house ever be rebuilt? Well, not mm -hmm. only did he rebuild the house, but lo and behold, he did it with Gentiles. Now, mm -hmm. who would have ever expected that? That's right. The Jews didn't, they, they didn't expect, even the Christian Jews didn't expect mm -hmm. God to do it that That's way. That's right. All at once, this, this, this thing got rebuilt yeah. with Gentiles. Now, see, that root's still in the ground. Oh, We've been grafted right. into it. It's yeah. still in the ground. Paul said there's going to come a day when the going to come out of Zion and turn on godliness from Jacob. That's right. Mm -hmm. It's going gonna, it's gonna to happen probably just like you... If we're alive at the time, we'll probably say, "My goodness, the Lord, it had to have been the Lord to do this." It's going to happen just like the, like the, it happened Amen. to the Gentiles. Yeah. The people weren't expecting it, mm -hmm. but it was effectively done, and only a report of it. Amen. See, this this men will not come at this knowledge just by theorizing about it. Amen. Just like the early church didn't didn't just kind of study their way into this; they got some reports. That's right of what God had done and the reports of what God had done they correlated with scripture they saw that same thing uh, will happen with the Jews <laughs> when God through Jesus commenced to rebuild and restore and refurbish the house he was building for David it was enlarged to make room for the Gentiles who were told from day one that they were God created them to seek the Lord if happily, if happily they might find him. So that was the aim, but they really couldn't engage wholeheartedly in this search until sin was taken away, Amen. until the devil was destroyed, uh, until principalities and powers were plundered. They really couldn't throw themselves into this until then. Yes. Amen. Boy, that's how critical what Jesus did. Yes was now here's what James said later men and brethren hearken unto me hearken unto me now now remember these were ordained God ordained these people now he's gonna he's gonna put it in in other words hearken unto me Simeon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name and to this agree the words of the prophets, as it is written, and then he quoted the passage that we're studying tonight. Yeah. Amen. Mm -hmm. You see how what sin did, brethren, to the human race? Yep. Men could not even effectively seek the Lord mm -hmm. until this thing of sin had been settled. Yep. <laughs> because Satan held the people. Yep. He held the people. He had to be... He had to be destroyed and he had to be plundered so they could seek. Yeah. And from a higher viewpoint, God was taking them. Yeah. Amen. He was right. taking them out uh -huh. from the higher viewpoint. <coughs> so given the, the Lord worked with the Jews, and, and, and creating some kind of a framework in which a son could be born and cultured and die. Right. But they, they actually, the framework got in the way. They couldn't see <laughs> what God was doing because of the framework. The mm -hmm. Gentiles didn't know anything what was going on. They had no clue about it. And yet God takes the ones with no clue and brings them into the house, cut, breaks the branch off, as it were, for a while. And then in the end, when it looks like it's impossible, like Brother Jason just said, he's going to graft in and again, right. he's going to get all the glory in the Amen. end. Amen. 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 It says he, they've been hardened. Yeah, that's until right. That's right. Blame full number yeah. of Gentiles. That's right. Amen. 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 
the remnant. Yeah. But the rest were blinded, he yeah, said. Right. See, at the beginning, mm. the Jews come in by, fl by, by floods. Uh -huh. yeah. the, the rapid expansion, the Jews, mm -hmm. see, because the house had to be occupied. That's you couldn't right. build a house and the house not be occupied. Yeah. So it, the Jews mm -hmm. began to come in. But it was just actually a remnant. But the numbers sound big, but it was just actually a yeah. remnant. But that's sanctified the house. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Also, the Gentile. And to the Jew and to the Gentile also. Mm -hmm. So that's sanctified. Yeah. Those Jews were like the first fruits. First fruits. Right. Yeah. Amen. Uh -huh. that, that's, what Pen, that's what the Feast of Pentecost was. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. mm -hmm. Now you remember that in our text, the last words are, the Lord who doeth all these things. Right after James quotes this passage, he says this in Acts 15, 18. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Mm -hmm. That's his grand summation yeah, of, the, of the quotation of the Amos text. Huh. Now Paul, he affirms that the inclusion of the Gentiles to which this prophecy referred was involved in the mystery that was uniquely revealed to him. Uh, yeah. Here's what he said. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in a few words, whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge of the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise by one gospel. That's the same, yeah. same thing Amos was saying, same thing James was saying, uh -huh. but it was revealed, the, the details of it. Yeah. Revealed, and then Paul goes on to say it was to provoke the Jews to jealousy. So this activity was Je this activity of the people being swept. It was Jesus building the house. <laughs> I will, I will build my church. That's how he put it. Well, it was a, and from this perspective, it was building this house. He said he'd raise up to David. Centuries passed. The situation of Israel grew worse. However, in the fullness of time, Jesus came. Yeah. He settled the sin issue, took it out of the way, went back to heaven, and commenced building a house. <laughs> and we, by God's grace, are in, in it right now. It was to provoke the Jews of jealousy. Now, Amos didn't know what he said, uh -huh. didn't know the significance of what he said, as Peter said, it wasn't revealed to them. They didn't say this for the Jews then, or for the prophets then. It was for us, upon whom the ends of the world are come. It's to ensure us Gentiles that we got in this thing by grace. Amen. We got in this because of the building that Jesus is doing. Yeah. We got in this because God chose to took out a took out a people for his name the whole work is of God you didn't get on it on your own anymore and this house was built by its own yeah, that's right. Amen. see see how it glorifies God when you see this yeah. this accounts this accounts for why we were saved we don't we don't have to theorize about it and try and adopt some kind of a philosophy of how we got in and all this mm -hmm. let's get up high enough to see that salvation is of the Lord Amen. And I, the Lord, do all these things, like he said, like he said in our text. Well, to me, I just was, I was just was blessed by this text, the thoroughness of it, and his faithfulness. Now, he did. He, you say, well, why did he say all that to David? So that you'd see that God does what He says He'll do. He set David up. See, he made a promise to David. It looked for hundreds of years like it didn't come to pass. Uh -huh. But this is all confirming to you, God is faithful. Yes. God does what he says he's going to do. If he tells you, my son's bringing the sons to glory, you can bank on it. That's what he's doing. See, so it, it, it refurbishes your faith, so to speak. All right, any? Yes, Brother Tony. 
marvelous. Uh, and as soon as Jesus was exalted, it was open house. <laughs> now, yeah. the, amen, the first amen. fruit, then the Jews came in, and then the Gentiles. But now, uh, this first fruits that Brother Jay was talking about tells me there's going to be a harvest. Yeah, that's right. Oh, so yeah. there's the first fruits, yeah. then you got then you got the harvest the is harvest. to take place. So this this harvest, uh, the Jews is already in the house, yeah. of course. But now the harvest of the Jews is to come. Amen. amen. All Israel shall be saved. That's it right. Has, it is written, a deliverer shall come out of Zion, turn away and God and some Jacob. So they just, they just, and the, we, they're just the first fruit of Gentiles, too. Uh -huh, yeah. If we think there's a lot of Christians now, you ain't seen nothing yet. Amen. They're going to be real. Yes, yeah. but they're. Jew and Gentile <clears throat> is a pretty good case for God being no respecter of persons. That's right. And with, he has, he's proven that. All, all men are under the same condition, or in the same condition. Yes, amen. In, in sin and in Christ Jesus. That's, it's like sin levels the playing field, but then in, in, in Christ, every, everybody, uh, it's like all the same rules apply in Christ, whether you're Jew or Gentile. Amen. So you've got um, a condition with the Jews where he pours out all kinds of blessings and advantages and provisions. And they, they end up being under the condemnation of sin. Hmm. And then you got all the Gentiles. He doesn't he doesn't give them anything that he gives the the Jews the advantages of. But they end up under the same con condemnation. So he's proving that there's a level playing field. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Uh -huh. Amen. Hmm. That, that's how men wonder, how do you approach what they call evangelism? How do you reach people? This is how you reach them. You've yeah. got to come at the common ground level. Amen. You can't preach to people as they are distinguished by the flesh. Mm. Yeah. You can't tailor your message mm. according to fleshly distinction. Mm -hmm. You've got, your message has to be tailored by the revealed commonality. All have sinned, come short of the glory of God. Mm -hmm. yeah. All are vassals of Satan. Yeah. All are condemned. All are cut off. See, that's Amen. that's the level you reach people at. That's really good about James. I'm glad you spent some time on that. There was at least two. How many apostles were there? There was at least two apostles there in that meeting in Acts 15. Oh, yes. Well, it says the apostles and elders. So I yeah, get right. it. But, but the Spirit now, and give this to James. Yes. Yes. Uh, that's right. I, I appreciate it. Amen. And, and, and his... And, you know, that was, and like you said, that that was, and they received that. Mm -hmm. now, now, Paul and Barnabas and Peter, they knew that Gentiles had really been converted. Uh -huh. But James, he put it, he put it together yeah. and tied it to this text. Yeah. And that, I don't know if others, I think, I think the others, once he said this, they saw it. But oh, yeah. that's the point. That's God, see. Yeah. This is how God works. Uh -huh. He doesn't always reveal everything. Thing to the main person. There's some to it, like Paul. It is true. He received things that others didn't receive, but he received it to tell it. Yes, and you can see that the moment James saw this, he opened up his mouth. That's right. Amen. Amen. Hmm. He knew. See, he didn't wait and mull it over in his mind. He knew. He recognized because he knew Scripture. He knew this Word of God. But how many people would have, would have thought of Amos? Hmm. Huh? But that's what, that's, it just blesses, it just blesses me. Yeah. It opens the door to a lot of possibilities, I'll tell you. All right. Oh, it's good, wasn't it? <laughs> Love a word of prayer. Our right, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this text. We thank you for Brother James. We thank you for his perception about the book of Amos. And my, we... We glory in it too, Lord. We give you thanks for making us a part of the house. Amen. In Jesus' name, amen.